A very good morning to everyone. I bring greetings to all of you on behalf of my director, Dr. G. Narahare Sastri, director CSIR NIST, and the entire SRTP team here at CSIR NIST. It is my pleasure to welcome you all for today's eminent scientist lecture, and also our hearty welcome to our distinguished speaker for today, Professor T.P. Singh, ACRB Distinguished Fellow, Ames, New Delhi. Sir, it is a great honor and privilege to have you with us this morning. Thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation to deliver today's lecture and for uh, having you with us. Uh, thank you so much, sir. And uh, I think we will begin with today's program. So to begin, I request my director to give his welcome remarks and also to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. A very good morning to all of you. And it's a real great honor for all of us to have Professor Tejpal Singh, who has more than five decades of experience with science. He had his PhD in 1976 from IASC Bangalore on protein crystallography. And I think most of the audience were not born at that particular point of time. I hope and you were born. <laughs> I, I was born. I was a kid of about 10, 12 years. So uh, this is a great opportunity for us to listen from him on coronavirus protein structure and drug discovery. And Professor Singh is an immense uh, knowledge and insights in the crystal structures of proteins and protein small molecule interactions. And he played a pivotal role in structural biology, drug discovery, and he also initiated the clinical in informatics department in our India Institute of Medical Sciences. And he is one of the most distinguished scientists of the country. And he is a fellow of all the three academies of India, which are well known, and uh, the fellow of the Third World Academy of India, and uh, quite deservedly, when Professor J.N. Ramachandran medal was instituted, he was the first one to rece receive that. And he has received a large number of um, uh, awards which are instituted in the name of uh, Professor J.N. Ramachandran. And he's also a recipient of Jawaharlal Nehru Birth Centenary Lecture Award of INSA. And the list is endless, like Goyal Prize, Jesse Bose Award, and Humboldt fellowship, Canadian Development Agency Award, and so on and so forth. But most importantly, he is a very prolific uh, researcher and published over 420 papers of high impact and submitted more than 600 structures to PDB. This is a great contribution from our country. And I always feel energized and enthused Whenever I meet Professor T.P. Singh, I had a fortune to meet him in the last three decades in different capacities. And every time I meet him, he is uh, with full of energy and positive approach. But at the same time, he is very thorough and precise and uh, critical about how do we do research in general? How do we do research in drug discovery? and what is the role of modeling, what is the limitation of modeling, and what is the strength of modeling. And being a crystallographer, he has a very, very good insights on the protein structure. And sir, on behalf of all the participants, I would like to invite you. And before that, I wanted to bring to your notice that the summer research training program was uh, planned with a very short notice and we have more than 10,000 people registering in this and uh, a large number of people will be watching this program even after this is uh, over today <coughs> on YouTube and on behalf of CSIR NIST and our Director General Dr. Shekhar Mande and all the CSIR fraternity and the entire Indian students. I thank you very much for taking your valuable time 
and now I request you to deliver your talk on coronavirus protein structure and drug discovery. Please, over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sastri. Thank you for many, many good words. I think I personally feel that we don't have to say much about humans, but it's a great pleasure for me. And I think it's a very great opportunity this pandemic has provided to us that we could start using this kind of thing. I should tell the audience that Dr. Sastri is one of the finest, finest scientists I have met in this country. He does so well. In the very first meeting, I was so impressed, so impressed by him. And I'm so delighted that he is now directing a very nice place, a nice place at a location where it very much needed people like him. So it's a great pleasure that to be part of this summer training program and that too, which CSIR is doing and Dr. Sastri is coordinating. So it's my great pleasure, Dr. Sastri. I'm so delighted that I'm uh, interacting with people on your behalf and I thank you so much for this. Although I don't work on coronavirus, but I think if you work on proteins, you work on every biological system. And coronavirus is a, has given us, a, I also feel that this pandemic has been a very, very severe effect on mankind. Nevertheless, I think it's a great opportunity for us, for all of us, for scientists that to prepare ourselves for anything else to occur in the future. And I always say that if we know the structures of all the proteins in the nature belonging to all kinds of organisms, including virus particles, solving problems in a short time when things happen will become very much feasible. Therefore, I think combination of the structural biologists, bioinformatic scientists, chemists and biologists together, I think it makes a great deal of, it will make a great deal of difference. I also feel that as is sometimes we may have opportunity in CSIR set up to talk. I think institutions in CSIR should be set up in a manner that there is a goal and to attain that goal, all the components are provided. I, I think one of the best systems I've seen in the Maxman system that the director is given Full, full opportunity to appoint as many people of any kind, but provide an answer to the problem. So I, I think that is one thing uh, which will be very important for all of us, that if you start combining a team in a manner that we have a person who does the structural biology, the structures of protein, a person who does deep bioinformatics, someone who does synthesis, and someone who does molecular biology and other biology. That combination is a necessity and with this combination, lots of things will happen. So uh, this coronavirus is a great opportunity for us, although it's causing a lot of uh, problems, but I think we will come out and we will get better prepared for future things. So if you see this, uh, this slide, this map, I think it shows how badly it is spread all over the world. And I think it, it has been serious recognition that it went to all kinds of places. It, had, it followed no restriction of geography, no restriction of uh, quality of science in that country or wealth of that country. It is, it is really spread. And in most, so it is spreading more in those countries which are better prepared to tackle a problem, but nobody has been able to tackle. I think we were caught. We were caught in a manner that we didn't have uh, that sort of preparedness. And that's why we should really think seriously how to prepare for this kind of unexpected pandemics. Now, if you talk about coronavirus, I've just been very preliminary introduction because there are so many students here. Coronavirus is a, is a kind of particle that you have, I mean, it's all, most of the people might have read everything by now. The shape is like a corona, so corona name has been given. 
But what is important here, uh, this virus has such a number of proteins, not very large. And these proteins are distributed in four, four different regions. You have proteins which are part of the this nucleocapsid associated with the RNA, which is an RNA virus. You have proteins which are in the envelope. You have proteins which are membrane bound. You have proteins which are protruding out, and these are spike proteins. So these spike proteins are very, uh, very critical. Some of the structures are known, and they have indicated that this virus, when it enters the host, it, it interacts with one of the very famous receptors, ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme. And this affinity of these glycoproteins, these spike protein is very high in this case. That is why I think it is becoming tough. So what we need to think about this, how to, uh, how to prepare molecules which can bind to ACE2 stronger than spike proteins or prepare molecules which can bind to these spike proteins. Like these two proteins interact, how to break this interaction. So either use this ACE2 as the target or use spike proteins as a target. And of course, many other proteins in the virus can be used as a target. So I think uh, lots of structures are already known and lots of bioinformatics people have given lots of new new ideas. So we are already have learned so much about this. But just for for students, I think this virus primarily is found in bats, but doesn't transmit from bats directly to humans. It requires some intermediate host. So these are certain animals which can receive this and then they can transmit to uh, humans. So these, these, all these, of course, background knowledge, even young students know these days, very, very common now. So this is how it goes. So this also tells us that all these animals, it's an important point that all these animals, bat and all these animals, which can have this virus, their immune system must be very powerful and nothing happens to them in spite of this virus being there. So there's another point that we must study the immune system of these animals and look at those proteins which are part of the immune system, how they have become, how they are able to tackle this very dangerous virus. So lots of openings are happening to us how to look at this problem. Now there are four four directions people are really concentrating right now. Lots of people are working on diagnostic fits, although diagnosis is going on very, very extensively all over the world. But the attempts to make cheap and easily available these diagnostic kits so that we could examine rapidly and in large numbers is one area. And of course, you hear all the time about vaccine developments. We need to develop vaccines. Of course, vaccine development is not an easy process, but lots of efforts are going on and lots of locations, lots of companies in our country are also making progress. And several companies in the world are in stages of clinical trials, phase one and phase two. So hopefully something will happen in this direction. And then on the other side, we have lots of bioinformatics people are involved. They are, they are examining a large number of already available drugs, so-called repurposing process. They're trying those drugs, they're trying their combinations, and this is very much possible. You see, when you talk about uh, interactions of these proteins of this virus, and also inhibitors of ACE2, to, to make quick progress, is, it's good to try lots of drugs which have already been in practice, now, many of them may not be very, very highly potent, but they will have some level of potency. And if you could try number of targets in this virus with some level of potency of already known drugs, then they can become, a combination of them can become very effective. And as we know already, lots of such molecules are already being used. Hydroxychloroquine is one, Lambdacivir is one, and there are more, and more can come out very quickly. So slowly, the drugs will become effective in the meantime, while vaccine may take a while. And also you hear a lot of things that 
lots of people are talking about some kind of natural uh, natural products, extracts, lots of such substances. I think North is really rich in this. Now, many of these substances may have effect on immune system. They may they may activate in many ways, and also. I think all these uh, natural extracts, which are very historically, we have very important consideration of using extracts from natural, medicinal plant, natural plants, and they contain large number of molecules, and many of them may have some potencies, and together, many of them may have good effects. So this is how four things are going on, but I will talk about uh, major issue that is how to make drugs. But before that we should understand how do we tackle these infections, infections caused by viruses and also caused by bacteria. How, how is our system, our human system or animal system prepared to tackle these viruses? And how we have as human beings, as scientific community, and pharmaceutical industry have helped these, uh, the, this fight against bacteria and viruses. So the first and foremost thing is innate immunity. You might have heard a lot of people talking about improve your immunity. And one of the things in that is that improve your innate immunity. All of us have a natural defense mechanism. The first, first line of defense, the germline proteins, they are, they are members of the innate immunity. And these proteins uh, should, in principle, this is how the biological system is made, should, in, in principle, protect us, uh, protect us from all kinds of infections. Now, it doesn't happen in reality because there are so many reasons, so many reasons also that our immune system is not good enough, which is again dependent on a large number of factors. So, this is first requirement that we should understand how to improve innate immune system. And later on, I will tell you that how to exploit the innate immune system. You have seen some of the animals, some of the animals who are part of the very hostile habitats. They have evolved their innate immune system to become so potent that they can take all kinds of viruses and bacteria. Now, can we learn something from them or can we exploit their immune, innate immune system, the proteins of the innate immune system, and exploit them as therapeutic molecules to control infections in those animals where the innate immune proteins, innate immune system is not so powerful. So this is one thing which is very important. The strength of your innate immune system, exploit the innate immune proteins from those animals where their potencies are far superior than humans. So this is one aspect. This aspect has not been what you hear all the time that how to improve the innate immune system, but what you might not have heard much, how to exploit these proteins of the innate immune system to use them as therapeutic proteins to control this kind of pandemic situations. So this will, this is one possibility. It may not happen this time, but it will prepare us to think seriously and work on this for next time. And the next, of course, you, once you, your innate immune system is not able to tackle these infections, your adaptive immune, immunity takes over, you have antibodies, specific uh, antibodies against the antigens in these, in these uh, organisms, in the, uh, including the virus particles, they are the, against the proteins of those, those organisms you have specifically antibodies designed, antibodies synthesized in your body. This again depends upon this again depends upon how good your your T cells and B cells, your adaptive immunity is. If you have if you have very good one, it will tackle quite a lot. But most of the times we all live in all kinds of real conditions. We may not have that sort of capacity, then they left. In addition to this, to support this, vaccine is one approach that using this principle, making vaccines with 
that kind of antibodies so that it could make your adaptive immunity stronger and could help you in terms of protecting yourself. So vaccine in this regard is very important when your innate immunity has not worked, when your own adaptive immunity is not capable of protecting you, the vaccines are necessary here to provide support. So all kinds of efforts are going on in this direction in all over the world because that is something which can really protect you quickly. Now, as far as bacteria are concerned, there are also many viruses, antibiotics long ago were made, and when these antibiotics were made, I think they provided us great protection against bacterial infections and also in some cases against some viruses. So these were compounds initially obtained from microorganisms and subsequently they were improved upon in a variety of them were also prepared synthetically. <clears throat> so the, these three approaches are very strong approaches, but when they, they all don't succeed, then we scientists including Dr. Sassi in, in the East and many scientists in India and abroad and internationally need to make molecules, design compounds based on several approaches, design compounds which bind specifically and with high affinity all the targets in these organisms, bacteria and viruses. So that is where actually we know how to tackle this, but the question is that we are not so much prepared. So, so we need to really pre get prepared much more in this direction. So these are the four ways you tackle these infections. Just to, since there are students involved, uh, really you hear lots of times that human resource is one of the wealth of countries and developed minds, prepared minds are very important. So if you in terms of even civilization, when minds were prepared, just like to show you some kind of historical, ancient perspective that the civilizations had occurred in certain parts of the world before other parts. And when these kinds of diseases were there, they were there all the time. How these people were tackling them, they didn't have that much knowledge. They didn't have that much of uh, infrastructure in those years. How were they? fighting these infections. And it is very interesting to see in, in some sense, in case of this virus, this coronavirus, COVID-2, we are in the same situation that we have no medicine, we have no vaccine. So we are, I think, back to that stage, that how do we tackle? So these people, the people living in these parts of the world, can you see the precursor? Hello? Hello. Uh, yes, yes, sir. sir. Yes, sir. Are you hearing? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And can you see the precursor moving? Uh, we are in, sir, antibiotics yes, era slide. Okay. Any, but you can see the slide clearly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. I mean, there is a phase gap. There is a gap between our sounds. So you see in this part of the world, where people's minds were slightly more trained, the civilization occurred. They started using this just to give you a perspective that, you know, whether you call it a geography of science and how science progresses, this begins, this begins from a very, very sort of, I mean, if your mind can think, you can start from anywhere. So these people were preparing and they, they identified certain materials like molds, like soup mix with turtles, so, so many things they, they sort of prepared. And by way of observations, they applied to people, they gave to people who suffered infections and they observed beneficial effects. And that's how they, they, they made contribution. So in different stages of call it evolution or civilization, people evolved methods to tackle these things. So they did something similar that we today we are talking about, our ancient uh, uh, extracts, using them to improve our immunity, using them to 
to fight infection, and many of these instances, things are happening also. So it is something similar what people did in centuries ago when nothing much was known and they used certain materials. Now, the exciting part is that, see, they use these things. And when the industrialization occurred, when the science progressed, people started looking at these samples. And you see, this region was very much contributing this, where you see the arrows and the stars. But if you see in the next slide, the location has changed. Now, what these people started doing, since the science was progressing, they, they started recommending using molds for treatment, the, the mold, which the rotten thing, the which people observed in the previous, which you saw in the previous slide, in these locations, they started actually formally recommending those things. And then they said that they started observing culture fluid covered with mold did not produce bacteria. When they saw this, they realized that there's something is there in this mold which doesn't allow bacteria to grow. And then you can see series of things how development occurred. And finally, when your first antibiotics were discovered in 1928, this man, today of course we talk about science, very systematic science, very important laboratory practices, but in those years, science was a passion, not not thought of, uh, not worrying about uh, many things. So he left the petri dish where bacteria culture was growing, he left it uncovered. And one return, when he returned from to the vacation, he found that fungus grew on the bacteria culture. And wherever fungus grew, the bacteria did not grow. So if your mind is prepared, if your mind is trained, you will immediately think about that there is something in this fungus which is killing bacteria, not allowing it to grow. And then immediately, of course, if you have methods to isolate, methods to identify what this uh, fungus, fungal growth contain, you found that that's where the first antibiotics penicillin was discovered. And then, of course, a lot of things happened. So this is how the science progressed. Many times I hear, hear lectures today and every time we talk about drug discovery is a long drawn process. Vaccine development takes a long time. I think this is all because we are not well prepared. When we will be well prepared, we can shorten this time and we can tackle many of these accidental epidemics like, like the one we have here. So this is how we need to prepare and I think it's very nice the CSI started this SRTP, this kind of training program. It's training people, preparing people for science and I should I say it all the time, I say repeatedly that our real wealth is our human resource and training them for challenges will be great asset for them. So uh, I think in this direction, this conceiving this program is very good. And I'm happy that Dr. Sasri is coordinating this. That is the right kind of thing to do. Now I just want to give you an idea. You know, in the earlier times when antibiotics were already discovered, they were discovered in 1928. Thereafter, antibiotics were so, uh, commonly used where they were very potent. The scientists in the labs and companies didn't make many compounds. And if you see that some compounds were made, sulfonamides were made in 1932, and their derivatives were made subsequently, that's all. The one one stream of compounds, then gramazine a cyclopeptide was sort of prepared in 1939 and then quinolone. So very few compounds and then subsequently their de derivatives were used in therapeutic application, but this progress was too slow. So we needed to we needed to remain very intense. And I want to say this, that even if we discover vaccine, eventual solution to fight these infections has to come from drugs. So if, and there is a possibility in case of drug discovery that if we are 
to pair, we can discover drafts very quickly. So that, that point is important to keep in mind. Now just to come to this, how, how do we, how, how do we tackle these things? So I'm leaving aside these uh, people who are doing vaccine development. Vaccine development is one approach which is going on. It's a very standard approach, but it takes sometimes very uncertain, but that process go, goes on. But those scientists, the scientists who are doing molecular science, the doing with, with the drug discovery, are the two, two directions are very important. One is that we should try to think about innate immune proteins and how to exploit them for therapeutic applications and how to study proteins of those organisms where they have shown that they can fight these uh, very, very strong bacteria and viruses. So we need to sort of think about this and bring them to therapeutic applications. And other one, of course, is that we should think about studying all the proteins, all the proteins of all organisms and in the present time, all the proteins of this virus, COVID-19, and I think most of the proteins of COVID-19, many of them, their structures are known, and it is that inhibitors against many of them, the designed by using bioinformatics tool, but now since the structure are known, actually uh, experimentally you can design their inhibitors. So these are the two, two approaches we should do in addition to the vaccine development. And this is what I wanted to highlight here. Now, the, coming back to this, of course, we should, the, you have seen the, when the COVID-19 transmits to humans, it has some intermediate hosts. So there are some animals, and one of the animals you have seen was camel here. Camel's innate immune system is very peculiar. Its immune system also very peculiar. So studying the proteins of this kind of animals, which live in very hostile conditions, the extremophiles. So uh, I think that may provide us some sort of direction that the, the proteins in their rare human system could be valuable theoretic molecules. This is one, one thing. So in, in, when we talk about this, we have looked at proteins from this, this, and this, and we found, I'm not going to give details, we found few mutations, but a strong difference in terms of their potencies. And primarily, the innate immune proteins in these axiophiles, they acquire potencies by incorporating few mutations and converting their quaternary structures into different states, in the sense that in humans, the protein works as a monomer, in camels works as a like a dimer in porcine box as trimer. Of course, yeah, we don't know yet. So, so some small mutations will provide that sort of possibility that these proteins become much more potent than what you have in humans. So that's how one should study. This is just to give you an idea that in some species, the monomer, other one is the trimer and dimer, same protein. And that conversion occurs over the years when you are constantly, I mean, you hear sometimes that that your immunity improves when you have infections. So those animals which lived in those bad conditions, their immunity has already become stronger. And by examining those, those immunity proteins from those animals, we can learn from them, we can exploit them, and that's how we can go about this. This is something very simple slide. I think that uh, people like Dr. Sassi may be talking and teaching, it's lots of people Perhaps, I think this is the last slide. Mm. We have to finish by 45, isn't it? Dr. Sastri? Sujit? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You, yes, by 10.45, yes. yeah, yeah. we have some. Yeah. Fine, sir. So then we'll have question and answer. Yes. Ah, yeah. that, that's right. So this slide, I think, is a very common slide. Uh, this BSc and MSc students may not know this, but I think all research scholars working in many, many labs in CSIR elsewhere in the country, 
who are dealing with some kind of bioinformatics and drug discovery, they all will know about these four methods. And these four methods, number one, you hear so much these days because our chemistry has limitations to quickly follow the synthesis. So try to extract things from plants. They may have molecules which could bind to these proteins or virus with some potency. Use many of them and many of them can bind to more proteins and same proteins maybe uh, with varying potencies. So this is one area where lots of molecules are being ex extracted from natural products. And many times you want to call them medicinal plants and your place is very rich in this. So these extraction things, and this is one of the originally seriously Indian concepts, this thing we should go on anyway and prepare these molecules. And even if they are not finally very potent, they will provide some sort of direction with some kind of affinity and on that chemistry can be built in. So this is something should go on. And next, of course, it's very important that synthetic organic chemists, they keep on making a lot of new compounds. Many of them follow direction from as to what sort of structure should be designed, but many of them, I think, keep on making large number of compounds, and these compounds can be tested and tried. And I think it's a quite a big business today that you substitute one group, replace another group by another group, make large number of components, and then make libraries, do this through the screening. So these kind of things will go on. And of course, this is one of the most clear ways of drug discovery. If you know these structures in principle, by looking at these structures, you can have an idea in your mind what kind of molecule will fit into this. And of course, you can also check the bioinformatics tools to see how it fits into you and drop into this, examine the interactions and examine the sites which interfere with the interaction and examine the complementarity of these groups and these molecules with the protein it is interacting, whether you can, by modifying, by changing, can improve the affinity. So this is a very rational approach. And using this approach, there is certainty that we will definitely make compounds which will be good uh, antagonist inhibitors of proteins. So this process has to go on. And this is where it's very important that we should determine the structures of all the proteins. So when this virus came in too, suddenly people have to think about determining structures. But we already know structures of those proteins or similar proteins. We can very quickly move on to drug discovery approach. This last one is, of course, lots of companies are, when they cannot make compounds very quickly against, against particular disease, they keep on trying making compounds, keep on making libraries, and libraries are becoming a good source of revenue. So these things are going on, but I think they have to go on with much more intensity. I, I feel that the future, future of countries, the economies of, the future economies will depend upon how good we are in pharmaceutical industry. And I think it's a very, very nice to say that when hydroxychloroquine was supplied by India, it was a great feeling that we were making these drugs. That might be a generic drug, but this turned out to be very useful. So the future of economies and I think power of countries will be dependent on, in addition to many other things, on this pharmaceutical industry where we make drugs, vaccines, and uh, what they call these days is biosimilars, antibodies, stronger antibodies, biosimilars or biovectors, all these things will really provide the solution. When you talk about this structure-based rational design, see the problem was that so far we were making them, or Generally, other methods are more or less some kind of trial and error and, and some kind of chance discoveries. But when you do proper rational approach, and what you need to know is that you identify a target, and target is most often the protein molecule. 
And if you know the protein structure, this can give you an idea what kind of compound you should make. And based on based on this information, you design compounds and you synthesize compounds, and then frequently you can do binding studies and tests and see the what is the potency. And if the potency is not very good, make a complex with the protein. Examine the interactions. Identify the possibilities, possible sites of modification, and follow this path very quickly. Every time, any every step guides you to the next step, which improves the design. So this will be the real future solution. Now this is just to give you the students um. This, see, this is a protein molecule. <coughs> when you, just find a few words, when you talk about protein molecules, unlike small molecules, they, the interactions are based on the, the binding site they have. And the binding site is not just a chemical site. This site is, has some kind of structure. It has some kind of shape. And the shape is uh, the 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 boundary of the shape has chemical some chemical nature. So what you need to know is that what is the shape of the binding site and what is the chemical nature of the binding site. And if you know this shape and chemical nature of the binding site, the protein more I mean in simple terms if I say to be a CMSC student, it's like a lock and key. A key can only operate if it fits into the keyhole very precisely. So protein molecules have a cleft hole, a site, where only those molecules which have very complementary structures can enter and can fit in this. Now this is the first step that we should be able to go inside the binding site, the keyhole of like that. And then it should form interactions. And interactions can only occur if you just complementary groups. So therefore, unlike ordinary chemistry, the interactions with proteins are governed by their stereochemical features of the binding site. And this is why the structures of proteins are necessary to be determined. So this is just a gist. I think we are already for you. This is just a gist that to summarize, I would say that we may not be working on virus, viral proteins or bacterial proteins, but I think all proteins are proteins. Those who are who examine the structures of proteins, they can examine the structures of proteins from all organisms, and that attempt should be immediately made that we determine the structures of all these proteins. And in the in the meantime, when we are trying to develop the structures. We should examine these mo molecules through bioinformatics tools as well. So lots of times some information comes. So, but then these sort of things, the structural determination, the bioinformatics related investigation should be combined by, of course, biochemical binding studies and other analysis. So combining structures, combining bioinformatics tools, combining uh, biochemical in interactions, assays, interactions with substance, binding affinity, and of course to have this, uh, prepare these proteins in large quantities to molecular biology tools. So all these things together can expedite things. And I think it is important to, in future to consider to combine all these things in the same place if you have, if your goal is drug discovery, I think like many many centers, many companies in vaccine research, they are so well prepared. It's very nice, nice thing they can move on to this very fast. Similarly, drug discovery, we must have these components. Component where somebody prepares proteins, clones it or isolates it from natural system. Somebody does a structure. Somebody does binding studies and then somebody does bioinformatics things, and then of course next step, how to take it to the uh, next step when the potency is good to, 
to drug development, and that's where the combination, of course, with industry comes. I also should say and emphasize that uh, I've been to Dr. Sassi in East and Northeast. They have made many, many compounds, and many of them are isolated from medicinal from natural products, and many of them are very effective. So these contributions are being recognized now when this kind of uh, pandemic has occurred, when we had no drug, I think the preparations from natural products, from medicinal products, have been very handy. And uh, so we have to combine all these things. So in other words, what my message is to that science is a very important field, and the most important field in science today is drug development, and drug vaccine development, and to do this, we should make all efforts, and that will lead us, that will prepare us to fight future pandemics much more. Lots of times, lots of people have said that India has done much better than any other country because of our, because of many factors. So uh, it was a great pleasure for me to participate in this. Of course, I cannot see, uh, I wanted to show some models, but I cannot show because <laughs> I'm not seen in this screen, but next time I think we will prepare better. So very happy to to be part of this. I thank Dr. Sastri, I thank everybody in the SR TP team who made this possible. And so thank you so much. All the best we can have some interaction. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I think that was I such that was important and uh, informative and, uh, lecture. Informative lecture. Especially in today's mm. context, when context, you, know, you know everybody is everybody talking is about uh, coronavirus, drug discovery, the, the vaccines, or the drugs, the whole world is discussing and just looking at the scientists and researchers to do something about this. So I think uh, your lecture must have definitely, you know, given a new line or new way of thinking for those people, especially who are working in these areas. Uh, for developing uh, drugs and vaccines in the, for against SARS-CoV-2 virus. Thank you so much, sir, once again. And uh, sir, we have uh, so many comments and questions from our participants from the YouTube, Facebook, and MS Teams. So uh, we would like to take uh, around six or seven questions uh, out of all these so many questions. So if you have time, yeah, sure. uh, I'd like to take these questions to you, sir. And I have a very uh, dynamic team here who are collecting all these questions from these platforms. So I would like to now request Ms. Lisa Monikalita to please take some of these questions. Ms. Lisa. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, sir, for illuminating us with such an insightful and informative lecture. Uh, sir, there are numerous questions and we have selected few of them. So if you permit, can I go on with the questions? Uh, sir, the first question is from Akanksha Sharma. She is asking, does the effect of coronavirus severity depend on the type of blood group individuals have? It's difficult to say that blood group will do that, but definitely it will depend upon the immune system people have, but I don't think blood group that way uh, specific will have any role to play. Yeah, I know Akanksha, I think she's the same Akanksha. So there, 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 is, there is no such thing that we can uh, correlate with blood group. But of course, depending upon the immunity differences in the in the immune system of different people, there will be differences in terms of response to coronavirus. So this is how I think about it. Sure. Thank mm -hmm. you, sir. The next question is from Madhu Priya Silvaras. Uh, whether, uh, whether any drug can damage the immune system of human body, uh, if at any time we use antibiotics, how can we improve the immune system of human body? The immune system can be can be damaged in many many ways. See all all kinds of uh, these are protein molecules in your body, and they they have their specific functions. When you take lots of molecules, when you 
they go there, they, some of them can bind to their binding sites and can influence their activities. So specifically, it's difficult to say, but this is normal that any protein in your body, when you take large, many molecules through diet and through as medicines, they may go inside your body and bind to some protein, but they bind them then dis dissociate also until they have a very high affinity. So this way, so of course, uh, there are lots of uh, lots of ways that we talk about how to improve our immunity. And I think we don't, of course, very clearly understand, but many molecules can activate some of the proteins in the B cells and T cells. So that sort of thing is a very uncertain way, but not very clear way we can say this. So the next question is from Sneha Jadeza. Uh, she is asking, can we use artificial uh, artificial intelligence in finding the vaccine and medicine for COVID? And will that be useful? Yeah, I mean, it's all knowledge. It's all knowledge. No, knowledge is very important, but eventually you have to make compounds, you have to make vaccine, you have to synthesize those things. But knowledge, when you say artificial intelligence, it's the knowledge which guides us to make many things and artificial intelligence can give you many, many ideas. Eventually we have to synthesize medicines and we have to make vaccines. So this is of course very helpful. Any knowledge like this coming from artificial intelligence is very helpful. Sure. Uh, thank you, sir. The next question is again from Sneha Jadeza. Uh, she's asking, uh, does temperature difference in geography has a role to play in the mutation of COVID? Yeah, I think there are lots of people talked about this, that <clears throat> the low temperature regions have high, high intensity, maybe the strain is different. You know, these strains may not the, uh, not specifically geographical regions, but there are many factors that these mutations these strains may vary, and there are the argument, but uh, there are certain strains in some countries and some somewhere. But these may have some effect, but not really seriously. Uh, after all, inside your body, the same. So that. Uh, thank you, sir. The next question is from Snehal Sharma. He's asking: Coronavirus have two strains. L type and S type. What is the basic difference between them? And also, why is the L type more aggressive? I think I can only basically say what is found in this coronavirus. In fact, what it is, what is making it different from other viruses, the affinity of the spike proteins to the receptor in the host is very high. is is higher than other cases. And that's what is making difference. Now, with this high affinity, it makes it uh, go into the cell more effectively. So, it's basically that is what one can say about because that's the entry point that decides the entry and how efficiently it enters. It it makes a difference. So, so far, very clear thing is known is that the affinity part is higher in this case, which is understood. The rest of the things we don't know so much. So that is one critical point which might vary. But these protein may have some mutations at the binding site. And also, I think sometimes these mutations may occur again and again. So it makes it a little bit different. But <clears throat> going into the details, if we look at the structure of the spike protein which binds to the AC2 receptor and examine the interactions, and then examine what are the possible mutations and by keeping those mutations in mind we can design a series of compounds and use a mixture of them to tackle and that will take care of uh, the, these infections much better that way. Uh, thank you sir the next question is from nalini sharma she is asking uh, what makes coronavirus different from other known viruses 
and why can't conventional antiviral medicines uh, work on it? Yeah, so this is what I said just now. I think the entry point in coronavirus spike, spike proteins, of course other proteins may have also defensive. The spike proteins binding affinity is something which is already determined is higher than other viruses. So that makes it more lethal. And of course, there would be some differences in other proteins, proteases, other things, which might. But critical one is what is what we have understood through structures that the affinity part is higher in this case. Thank you, sir. Yeah. The next question is from Pinky Goswami. She is. Uh, she wants to listen from you something about plasma therapy. <laughs> I also, I also hear, I also see that. Well, what people think about this when you are already infected, you have developed antibodies. So from those patients who have got cured, their plasma could be given to patients who are suffering and that those antibodies may fight virus better. And that kind of thing is going on. I think there are, there are some some banks of this kind of banks are already made and is being applied. So the hope is that the, the antibodies of already cured patients may help to protect those patients who are suffering at this moment. So this kind of, it is already on, this is going on. So that's it. Sir, actually there are lots of questions. So if you have time, can we ask you two or three more questions? Yeah, you ask. Okay, yeah, restrict it to two or three more because I see more than 100 questions or 150 questions. <laughs> so <laughs> we will. Uh, OK, be selective, Lisa. Yes. Okay, sir. Uh, okay. sir, the next question is from Shribin. Uh, what is the importance of quorum quenching molecules in vaccine production? I think more questions should be asked in in terms of drug discovery, nobody's asking in drug discovery. <laughs> vaccine development is a separate thing, I think it's going on, so we don't have to talk much about vaccine development today. So you can ask next question. Okay, sir. Uh, so the next question uh, is from LKB Power. He's asking that there is a conflict regarding use of alcohol-based sanitizers versus soft solution. So please explain what is the best to fight against this uh, COVID-19. You see, when you talk about, this is simple, when you talk about sanitizers, they must somehow remove the virus from your hand I mean, when you're using it, hands or wherever, you should remove the virus. And alcohol that way is the best because it can dissolve them. Now other sanitizers, what they contain, and there's so many varieties. But alcohol based are tested and tried, and they they are very sure that they work very effectively. So lots of sanitizers, lots of things people are proposing, but they can go on. But I think some alcohol based sanitizers are doing well. Mm -hmm. that way. Oh, thank you, sir. And the next question, sir. Lots of people want to know about this. Uh, Ayurveda treatment, if anything is possible for this uh, treatment of the virus via, uh, via Ayurveda. You see, lots of people are doing this. You know, when you say Ayurveda means what? It is sort of um, plant extracts only, the, those kinds of extracts. And they're all already applying also, they're using it. But this is some kind of blind science in the sense that we don't know what it contains, but it may have some beneficial effects. So when you don't have specific molecules, specific drugs or vaccines against something, you could try all kinds of preparations, like Veda or uh, natural products or whatever. But they don't require, uh, their preparation can be very fast, but they don't require stringent clinical trials. When we make drug in a normal way, a compound we design as a drug, then it has to go through many steps. So. In this way, I think Ayurveda has advantage that they can try anything. And the standard ones which they have, according to the procedures, that may have some beneficial effects. But 
I don't want to say much about this because the potency cannot be. You cannot say anything about that, but some effects may have, and why not? In a situation when you don't have anything, you can try this also. Sure. Sir, thank you so much for all your answers. It was a great privilege for us to listen to you, sir. So thank you. And now I'm handing over the session to Ilika, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, thank you so much once again, sir. Uh, yes, we have so many questions, hundreds of questions, but uh, uh, in a such a short period of time, we cannot take so all these questions. So what we have done is we have summarized some of these questions into one, uh, one question. So thank you so much once again for so patiently answering all the questions and for taking the time out to be with us this morning and to deliver this uh, lecture. I think it was one of the most important lectures that we had uh, that we've had under this platform. Thank you so much once again and uh, to formally, you know, give uh, off for the word of thanks. I would like to now request uh, Dr. Biswajit Saha, who is a senior scientist of CS NIST. Uh, Dr. Biswajit, over to you now. Thank you, Iliga, ma'am. Uh, thank you, sir, for giving such an in-depth talk on coronavirus and how to combat scientifically. It was a great treat to listen to you, sir. We strongly believe all the participants are enlightened and inspired very much by your talk. Thank you very much for sparing your valuable time to ignite the all young minds. We thank Professor G. N. Sastri, our director, CSR NIST, for all valuable guidance and mentorship. We sincerely acknowledge the whole SRTP team for the successfully conducting this session. Thank you all. Okay, Mr. Jit, one comment I want to make. I just yes. wonder about if I had this uh, coronavirus component out of this lecture, I wonder whether will there be so many questions? Yeah. Mm. Yes, sir. <laughs> truly, truly said, sir. Good. Thank you very sir, much, sir. Okay. Dr. Thank Sastri, you, Namaskar. Namaskar. I also thank you very much. I, I don't know how how useful it was, but this is an exercise perhaps we should do anyway. So. That you is a height something. of humility that you always have. No, no, I think. <laughs> Yeah, it's a direction we have to move anyway. But this is something good you arranged like this, and you will continue to doing this as part of your this program. I think it's a very positive contribution. I want to thank you this on my behalf also that. Thank you, sir. On behalf stimulating, of all. Uh, stimulating people is very important. What you are doing is a very huge contribution. Thank you so much from my side. Thank you again, sir.